welcome back to the main stage. I can see some people are still at lunch, but if you're standing around wondering when things are gonna get started, the answer is now. We are continuing on with our afternoon program. Still a lot to look forward to, including a discussion on B2B and VC investments. And before we get started with this panel, I wanna take a chance to bring up one of our panelists and give him a chance to give some remarks based on his own experience at the IBB, the Investitionsbank Berlin. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Matthias von Bismarck Austin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Oh, just a few words about Berlin as a crystallization point for Industry 4.0 as uh, introductory to this panel discussion we have there. Well, Berlin is such a crystallization point, and why is that so? It has to do with history and with mentality. Why history? Well, Berlin has so much experience with change, and um, so that's why it is our mentality not to block change, rather than to welcome it. And this mentality of Berlin invites and encourages entrepreneurs and qualified workforce to come here. And uh, Berlin had also his very fair chair, more than fair chair in this disruption. Since the fall of the wall, we have lost no less than 270,000 jobs in industry, with only 120,000 jobs left. And that was certainly painful. But maybe the outcome at the end was positive because we b rebuilt 270,000 new jobs in the service sector. And the digital economy has made the strongest contribution to this with now 77,000 regular jobs in the digital economy. So the sector information and communication contributes as much to Berlin's GDP as the whole industry does. So Berlin, that is a totally different picture as the one for, uh, representative for Germany, as you heard this morning from the Minister of Economy. Berlin's original strength in the digital economy was B2C. But since a couple of years, we observe a shift from B2C to B2B. And we at Investitionsbank Berlin have won a lot of new clients in which focus on industry for zero as well as digital health in, uh, since two years also fintech. Berlin has understood that we have to invest in infrastructure and there was a demand from investors to develop a new mobile network, 5G, and Berlin reacted as to implement experimental test field right in the city center of Charlottenburg. Not many cities do that, uh, to use the inner city center as a test bed. So what are the ingredients for strength in the digital sector? In our opinion, in our observation is first of all entrepreneurs and workforce. We fortunately had managed to attract them. And others are the presence of many medium and large scale companies who build up representatives here of offices or uh, incubators and uh, workstations as to get in contact with Berlin based startups with a view to solve their industry for zero uh, problems and, um, and challenges. And we have a very rich R&D landscape with um, several universities and uh, scientific institutes such as Fraunhofer and as transmitters such as the Technologie Stiftung Berlin, which play an important role in that. And last not least, we have um, a very rich VC scene at Investitionsbank Berlin, our, uh, at our Beteiligungsgesellschaft, we have no less than 350 co-financing partners all over the world. So many important VCs are here, and those who are not here, at least they have their scouts who, uh, which uh, spot opportunities for them. So our economists expect that by 2025, 
we have 270,000 new jobs in the digital economy. In the no, in the context of the digital transformation of our economy, and well, I look forward to discuss that here in the podium, uh, some with some more detail, and uh, I hope it will be a controversy discussion on Industry 4.0. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bismarck von Osten, von Bismarck von Osten. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, it's that less correctly. less complicated than that. Yeah. yeah but Matthias also works. Matthias works? OK, <laughs> cool. Matthias, I want to invite you to take a seat and share you. your expertise on our panel. Let's bring out our panel moderator. His name is Michael Bim. Did I get it right? Yes. Cool. Welcome to you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the intro. Um, so after having heard already uh, Matthias godfather of the Berlin startup financing um, scene. I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Katrin Leonhardt from KfW on stage. She is basically the backbone of the German SME and startup financing. Please, on stage. Join us here. And then, um, Next one, Alex von Frankenberg from Heiter Gründerfund, the rainmaker for all German startups. <laughs> Welcome. And now, finally, Gonzalo Martinez from Samsung Global Ventures, Samsung's secret weapon in the fight for great tech startups. So today's topic is uh, investors' tech instinct where future value lies in B2B markets. Um, and I would like to ask uh, the panelists, as a quick introduction, not to tell their amazing CVs, which you can read in the program, but everybody for 30 seconds to tell us their best experience as an investor uh, or the best decision. And also, of course, for 30 seconds, their worst decision or experience as an investor. And I think we should go from right to left. So Matthias, please, if you can start. So the best in the B2B sphere was uh, Open Synergies. This, open, this um, uh, company, software company working for automobile companies. I would also say with, our, our, uh, with Kiwi, the digital door opener, who is also present here later at, at, at the red stage. Um, and. Um, well, we also uh, uh, contributed to the creation of a unicorn in Berlin. This is a company here. So their predecessor was Gate5, which we uh, supported a couple of years ago. And the worst, well, for a development bank, it is in, not opportune to mention <laughs> cases which didn't work out. But obviously, they exist as well. OK, uh, Catherine. I'd like to start with the past. I mean, KFW as a public uh, investor uh, did also, like other investors, bad experiences during the end of the 90s on the top of the, t of the hype. And we had did a lot of learnings from that. And we have decided uh, to invest only into VC funds and to do the business very properly, but not to invest direct in startups. And I think, and it's a kind of an honor to Mr. Frankenberg, one of the best decisions of KFW was the decision in 2005 to invest into the Hightech Gründerfonds, yeah, which was initially started. And uh, now we are in the third round of the HTGF. And uh, I'm very, very proud that the HTGF is doing a very good performance, has an excellent management team, an excellent team, very good diversified uh, portfolio, and, the, uh, and it performs much better than our initial expectations. No worst. You so the, the public <laughs> entities are very, very, how to say, careful. Alex, now, but we really need a worst one from you. <laughs> well, uh, <coughs> the, the worst one, <laughs> obviously, uh, we just uh, recently compiled the list of our anti-portfolio, and there's some really, really good companies that we declined. So I think the worst uh, decision was uh, to not invest in a company that was sold for 50 million uh, just recently. So that's really bad. And the best, um, I think, um, was we just recently sold uh, a B2B cloud uh, solution, Cumulosity, to Software AG. 
And the best uh, decision was not to invest in the company, but was to decline five previous exit opportunities with that company at much lower prices. And, and, and that's very tough. Declining very profitable exit opportunities is very, very tough to do. Great. So, Gonzalo. Sure. I think uh, in terms of the best is the fact that I get paid to see and to dream about the future. I hang out with the smartest uh, kids uh, all over the world. And I think that's you know, the highlight of, of my um, life as a corporate VC. Of course, you know, the exits <coughs> are exciting and you get to see people who are now on the newspaper. You see them in the NASDAQ with the bell and you say, hey, I invested in you. You know, all that is very cool. Um, but also, when you spend some time and you see a startup from the beginning to the point where they call you and you say, you know, we got it. We have a startup called Stardot that is charging uh, batteries in a significantly lower time than normal batteries. And uh, when they tell you we have the specifications for the market for this to be commercial very soon, this is the, the kind of boost that, that makes it cool. And in terms of, of the bad things, uh, I think the, the more a uh, frustrating thing is when you see technology and teams that deserve being invested and because of the market, the market may have a stigma on say wireless charging or other things like that, they don't end up getting, and we even as corporate VCs don't end up investing in them. But you know that that's going to happen, it's just a matter of time. That's kind of the, the bad side of, of things. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So now directly start. Let's talk about money. Um, so Alex. You've seen many, many, many companies. In what area of uh, in, the, in the B2B space will most billionaire founders be made, from your, in your opinion? So, so B2B, I think it's a good question. Because in Germany, our genes are much more B2B than B2C. So we're really good at uh, generating B2B companies uh, and not so great in B2C. So that's a good focus. And you know, coming from the problem, uh, if, you, if you look at B2B transactions, especially for startups, they're very, very difficult and time consuming. So a startup selling their product solution to another business, it can easily take two years. So, um, so solving that problem, addressing that problem, reducing the, you know, in the end, the sales cycle significantly will definitely generate uh, huge successes. So what can that be? Anything in that process. So lead generation, communication, uh, the whole sales process, finding, uh, finding uh, you know, the decision makers, the whole test process. So everything that cuts down the B2B sales cycle, which is huge, you know, which increasing trust, that could, could uh, generate uh, billionaires. So what I'm talking is something uh, I don't know exactly, uh, but something that uh, is around an SAP, an automatic solution that helps to speed up the whole process of selling within the B2B space. It will be huge. I don't know the solution. It could be around blockchain. It could be around social networks, information gathering. Um, it could be anything. But I, I, I know if we see something that, that addresses that huge problem, it can be very big. Excellent. Thanks a lot. So. Now, as we speak about startups, Gonzalo, from, your, uh, from what you've seen, what's the most ambitious startup uh, in Europe? And what can other entrepreneurs and corporates learn from that? Well, what's the most ambitious startup in Europe? That's a, that's a tough one. I think I'm going to have to uh, shift the geography to Israel, because this is where I usually invest. And it, it's gonna you be can Israel. say it's part of Europe. Yeah, exactly. We, it's close enough. Um, I don't know if it's the most ambitious, but I've seen a very, very cool uh, startup um, called Urban Aeronautics. And you know, there's been a hype over many topics. One of them is drones. Uh, but the interesting, in, interesting thing about this startup is the fact that um, they're not building a, a traditional drone. They're basically doing a new type of helicopter. It's a helicopter that allows you to land in very narrow spaces. And the difference is that the rotors, you know, what usually cuts into cables and creates accidents, is within the fuselage of the company. So what does this mean in the end? This is basically the first flying car. It flies. It's out there. It's made by um, the guys who invented the first uh, unmanned air vehicle. And when you see it, you're like, this is the future. And it's coming. It's going to be out there very, very soon. 
So, so I think the, the most ambitious startup in, in Europe, in, uh, in Germany, and it's also a meta startup, is Rocket Internet. Rocket itself is a startup, but it's also a meta startup because it generates new startups, and it's definitely the most ambitious because these guys, Oliver Samba and the management team at Rocket, they think in billions and in double-digit billions, and they're very, very ambitious. Uh, absolutely. So uh, maybe not Matthias. Berlin is famous for its consumer startups like Zalando, SoundCloud. Um, but why, if I want to build a, a B2B tech company, why on earth uh, should I go to uh, Berlin? Well, I mentioned a, a few factors in my introductory why Berlin is strong. Uh, in the B2B sphere, I mentioned uh, R&D, uh, um, the um, scientific landscape, a lot of universities and uh, scientific instrument, uh, institutes, the presence of a lot of medium and large scale companies who serve as partners and contractual partners. And um, yes, Berlin attracts a lot of entrepreneurs and so on. But Berlin has always supported B2B, but 20 years ago, Berlin also made bad experience, and investors made bad, bad experience with B2B, and then they switched to B2C, and uh, thanks to Rocket and others, um, well, a bit to our surprise in Berlin, B2C has been a big success for Berlin. But now, we have to manage the shift towards B2B, and uh, to our delight, since two years, this renaissance of B2B proved valid and uh, sustainable. Okay, great. In your speech, in your introductory, you also mentioned capital. Uh, maybe a little bit out of the ordinary. I mean, all the companies need lots of capital, and I think we need to do something about it. And I would like, uh, maybe a little bit to a surprise, ask Alex now to um, pitch a new $1 billion or Euro fund to Catherine from KfW, to give him one billion. Now, 30 seconds, go. Well, that's very easy. You just mentioned we're the best management team in the market, so that point is taken. <laughs> and people really think we're a seed investor, but we're also a growth investor. We have a portfolio of 270 companies, and most of the time that we spend, we're spending on growing them, and we could easily deploy half of the one billion in the existing portfolio, and the other half in companies we know in the market, and I can guarantee you we bring back uh, the money three times, covering all the losses you might incur with other fund investments. <laughs> wow. Oh. Applause. Amazing. You know how, how you, you know how you teach founders always like have your elevator pitch ready? He really has his shit together. You can learn a lot from that. So, but now, big question. Deal or no deal? <laughs> <laughs> Alex. I'm, I would have expected that you would be a, even a bit more ambitious <laughs> and not pitching for a fund of one billion, but even more. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good answer. Amazing. <laughs> so um, politicians or public in public entities seem to be already much further than, than the private sector. Uh, amazing. But now, obviously, that, that was a little bit of a joke. But um, to, to come back to, to the real question, what is uh, KfW um, really doing to foster and support uh, the German and European VC ecosystem? Yes, as I mentioned before, we have, uh, we, we, we have a new strategy since two years and we have decided to, to mobilize everything in order to invest into fund of funds in in German fund of funds, but also in European and international fund of funds. And we want to be a very reliable and sustainable investor and giving uh, the incentive to say, well, to put more money into the funds. But what we see right now is that uh, we have seen uh, in the last two years 150, 200 funds coming all from all over the world, and more than 70% were uh, beneath, also under 150 million euros too much too small yeah, in order to really manage the growth potential what we have in Germany and what we have identified and everybody knows yeah, that we have a big 
gap in providing venture capital for the uh, startup and early uh, growth period. And I think it's m very much worse to have a strong investor and an investor to be uh, to stay at the market also in uh, difficult periods and to have uh, the, 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 the trust that KFW will be there and can amount, uh, can, can invest uh, into VC funds. What we also did, and I think it is a good sign to say, we have created an own public fund, but this fund is called Copari, it is a, a little, little brother of the HTKF, but it will grow. Uh, and Caprarian will invest into startups uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the startup and growth period. And it's one of the biggest C funds in Germany with a capital of 225 million. And Caprarian can only invest together with private investors. And that is our strategy to mobilize private capital uh, and not doing it alone and crowding out. And uh, uh, and yeah, we are very hope, uh, very very hope uh, that uh, that can mm. can work the strategy. What we also can do, and I think that is the role of a public investor, also to network, to give platforms to to exchange experience. That we have round tables. We work together with the Deutsche Börse, with the Equity Forum, and things like that. And for that, we are there. Um, great. Maybe I can add one question. You said. Funds in general in, in Europe are too small. Do we need something like a European-wide initiative uh, of private or also public institution to foster that something like Airbus did in the aerospace industry? It, it can be very helpful, and it's, there's already some beginnings. Yeah. For instance, I mean, the EIF, the European Investment Fund, is re doing a very, very good job yeah, to, uh, to head uh, together with, with, with the member states, created a virtual venture pl capital platform where the investors in Europe, public investors and private investors can meet, can share due diligences and things like that, and to decide to invest in funds. We have a very strong cooperation, for instance, with the BPE France, and we have invested together in, in funds in, in the, uh, who invest in German and French startups. And I think since the elections, uh, since Mr. Macron's, it will, we will end identify or intensify uh, these activities and yes we have to work together in Europe yeah to make the funds bigger and to to invest into European startups and not only in national uh, uh, thinking startups thank you um, great to hear so um, Matthias um, I know that uh, coming back to the startups themselves and also corporates you're a big fan of the concept of gigafactory versus microfactory um, could you explain that a little bit, um, especially in the, in the B2B context and what it means for startups and corporations? I'm not sure whether I'm a big fan of that. I, I would say that Industry for Zero is a challenge for all companies. But it brings about uh, two extremes in the production sphere. These are indeed gigafactories. For instance, uh, Foxconn, the contractual producer of consumer electronics, for Apple, for instance, in China, huge, huge plants, economies of scale, supported by industry for zero solutions. But on the other hand, economies of scope, micro factories, which you find in city districts. And maybe uh, Michael Porter wouldn't write today uh, the competitive advantage of nations. Maybe he wrote today uh, competitive advantage of regions, of cities, of city districts, and so on. So the smaller, the micro uh, factories uh, are, will be strong or are strong in the economies of scope, customization, very specialized products for niche markets. And the chances for startups also rely on interf uh, uh, interfaces, which in the context of large plants very often lack. So ABB, for instance, so they established plans from A to Z, but where the interfa interfaces where uh, startups could uh, come into the picture and uh, could implement their, in this section, production section, maybe superior solution. And in this sphere, uh, large companies should better cooperate with startups and should be, create more interfaces which allows uh, s startups to intervene and make their contribution. 
Interfaces, it's actually a great topic, and maybe I, I can ask that to, to Katrin from Cafe. Cafe traditionally had very close ties with a lot of large corporations, also the German Mittelstand uh, SMEs, um, uh, and now also you do a lot to, to foster the technology and startup ecosystem. What do you think could you do or should be done to increase cooperation, uh, co cooperation between corporations and startups? I think it is, it is essential for Germany, yeah? having a very strong industrial and technology basis yeah, to, to, to work together. And uh, I mean, this, this fair shows that it is, uh, in compliment to Mr. Oelke, it shows that it can be, can, it, that it is possible to bring together. There are several formats we can do. And I mean, yes, uh, to bring together the investors yeah, and the, the, the startups. Yeah. We uh, do together with the Deutsche Börse, the equity forum, also with the, with the European biggest place to, to meet and to, to exchange and, and, and to see uh, what is, what's going on and who, who will be interested to investing in me. What we see, and I'm very happy about this, that the corporates have developed a lot of initiatives, yeah, like corporate ventures, like Samsung Ventures, and also in Germany, uh, the Mittelstand, like Trump Ventures, came to the market and uh, either to invest but also to cooperate. And the next thing I think of that is, uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Frankenberg with the HTGF Partnering Day, a very good format to say, uh, to bring together the startups the HTGF has fi invested in with the corporates, with the Mittelstand and to work together. Yeah. Uh, thank you. you. You mentioned corporate VCs. Obviously, we have one on stage. So there's one question I have to ask uh, Gonzalo. And that's uh, late or just recently, Fred Wilson, the co-founder of Union Square Ventures, said, by, uh, said really, um, uh, corporate VCs are the devil. And he is one of the most successful VCs on earth. So Gonzalo, why are you not the devil? <laughs> Why should startups take money from you and not from Fred? Well, uh, talking about uh, B2B, I think the obvious answer is that through corporate partners, you can grow your startup very fast uh, and very big. This is the obvious. Uh, but also, I think you need to think of a corporate as a um, you know, fast, fast speed train, you know, one of these high speed trains um, that is going and if you stay in the middle, it's going to run you over. But if you go on the right timing and you get on it in the station, then it's also going to take you to your destination very fast. What does that actually mean? It means that you have to follow um, their timings. Um, it means that it's dangerous. Okay? Corporates can damage you because they have resources and they have the time, so that this can lead to delays. But at the same time, um, they can validate your technology. They can bring you amounts of capital that most other investors can't. And more importantly, they can give you engineering resources. You have to think of this as a gorilla. You know, the, the corporates are a gorilla. You have the baby. This is the startup. You know, the gorilla gets pissed off and it kills the baby. This is the first thing. We as corporate VCs are in the middle. We are, you know, in the zoo. Uh, trying to make sure that the baby is not too close to the gorilla, etc. Um, <laughs> but again, we are also incentivized as corporate VCs for the best of the startup. So I would say to that that whereas in the 90s and in the beginning of, of the, um, you know, in the 2000s, it was very common for corporate VCs to have very aggressive terms. These days, I think it's as good as it gets. The only thing you need to bear in mind as a startup is that we recommend that you go with a financial investor and a corporate, and not only a corporate alone, because corporates change, and you could see yourself trying to raise money on a follow-on, and the corporate, for political reasons or other types of reasons, not participating. So go along a financial and a corporate, but it's definitely, definitely worth it. Uh, maybe to, to, the, to the panel, an open question. Would you agree what experiences have you guys made with uh, corporate VCs? Do you, Matthias, do you want to start? With corporate VCs? Yeah. Um, you want me to be honest or yeah, less o honest? Always, always. I'm going to add on a little bit <laughs> afterwards with examples. We have some mixed experiences. And um, we noticed, or we, we sometimes witness experience of startups because corporates uh, change the strategy. 
and are no longer willing to, to support uh, the company, the startup, which they originally were very fond of. And this shift of strategy, and also very often linked to certain persons, new guys in the managing board, is uh, troublesome sometimes. Well, there are a lot of good experiences, but also some bad experiences. And um, I think that is this kind of, real, uh, of re reliability is very important when um, the corporates want to uh, sustain their role in the VC sector. Reliability. Just to make it a little bit more clear of the exits that we have in Israel recently, PrimeSense was acquired by Apple, who is the direct competitor of us. So we invest and co-invest with our competitors. We do business development. We encourage that, obviously. Um, we're a separate legal entity as Samsung Ventures, so there's a fiduciary duty we're on boards, when we were on boards. So yes, those troubles are, and those issues are known, well known, but if the entrepreneur comes in to the table understanding those and managing those, meaning not deciding your strategy based on you know, Samsung or Apple or other corporate strategy and you just follow your path and if Samsung strategy fits in, then you, you leverage that. If you understand those risks, risks the value is huge, is huge. So definitely continue talking to, to corporates. <laughs> well, um, I think there's both sides. The big opportunity is in whatever form of cooperation with the corporate, it can propel the business of the startup. So for example, if there's a significant working sales corporation, you can generate much more revenue. The risk is, there's many risks, but the main risk is if what the startup does becomes really, really interesting for the corporate, becomes really strategic, then of course the interest of the corporate is to acquire it as cheap as possible. And there's many examples, uh, also with Samsung, uh, in Germany, where they uh, were invested and then reduced the price uh, to acquire it cheaper, and that's totally okay. It's legitimate, of its economic behavior, but that can harm the value of the startup very significantly for the founders and for the other investors. And, uh, and there's also people in the corporate who are not as professional as the corporate venture unit, who uh, don't care about the corporate venture unit, who care about the big, big business, and then you know, it's, it's unpredictable what can happen. So I think you have to be very careful engaging with corporates. There's huge opportunities, but there can be uh, also huge problems. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, there was a growth uh, in the corporate venture activities at the, at the moment where the private investors, there was really a lack, yeah? And, and when we see the development of venture capital in Germany, uh, the corporate VCs played a very crucial role in a, in a time where there was not enough money into the VC market. And I think that is very, very important. But uh, of course, for, for, um, for some of the startups, it's, it's very good to, 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 to be acquired by a corporate. And for, for, for others, it would be, have been better. They could develop on themselves and maybe become a unicorn. Yeah. Uh, may maybe to add on this, um, maybe I can ask Alex, uh, what do you think are the most important things if you want to build a successful B2B startups? Um, and, uh, and why actually, what's necessary? We hear the, about the risks actually, but what's necessary for startups to have to win actually against corporates? And there are also enough examples. Yeah, I, I think the most important is, is uh, two timing issues have the product really ready. I think founders out of uh, research institutions, uh, universities, uh, underestimate the level of uh, the product has to achieve to the product quality, the, the readiness. They think the product is ready, but it's a mature prototype. So if the product is not ready, it's very hard to sell. So to get the last five or 10% of the product done uh, is often underestimated in terms of time and, uh, and also money. And the second timing issue is, as I mentioned earlier, is the sales cycle. So <clears throat> things in the B2B business tend to, to take much longer than, than you would think. Getting the product ready and getting it sold, especially in many industries, like the automotive industry, it takes not two years. That I mentioned earlier, it takes seven years. And there's other industries um, that, that also take very long. So if things take longer, it's very prudent to not spend too much money. 
So not in, in that phase, not to burn too much, uh, because you um, calculate the incoming revenues. And if that's the case, you spend too much, in, uh, revenues come, come in much later, then you need much more capital, you dilute much stronger. As a founder, that's not good. Or if you don't get capital, you fail. So being careful, being a little bit slower than you would think is right, is in most cases uh, the, 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 the right strategy. And then once you have right traction, then you can accelerate. We have one founder here in the audience, uh, Oliver Dening from Hornet Security. We are invested now for 10 years. And we've seen a few years ago, so the company was like seven years, that, that sales accelerated significantly. So they were not decelerating uh, because the product was achieving a you know, maturing product life cycle. They were accelerating because the company left the startup status after seven years. So, so the point is, it, it, it makes sense to accelerate, but not too early. And in that case of uh, Hornet Security, it took seven years when, when it was the right point to really accelerate. Interesting. Interesting. I, I imagine it's super hard. You have a product somewhat, and then you want to go out and push it, and then you take yourself back. So a lot of um, um, effort into that. Maybe uh, another question. I mean, we see so many amazing companies here, and, and there is so much going on. I always wonder, like, how on earth can you, can you keep up with that? Maybe to, to Gonzalo, um, like the speed of innovation is so incredibly fast. And as Samsung, you're actually looking on a global scale, basically every country in the world, so many different areas. How on earth can you keep up with that speed and with these many topics? What, I mean, how, what do you read? How do you prepare yourself? And what would you suggest to the audience and to us? So um, I think you can't cover it all. Individually, you need a lot of people, you need uh, a lot of geographies. You need also geographies to talk between each other because that's what all of the corporates are doing. You need to be at the, not just the peak or the leading edge in, Ver in Germany or in Europe, but worldwide. But I think uh, the way I get most of my information is through the meetings that I have with the entrepreneurs who, in order to come to me, have prepared very thoroughly in their areas. So they research a lot and you gather a lot of uh, interesting insights. Of course, of course, you read, you go to all of these conferences, but I think the most valuable uh, um, insights come from talking to other entrepreneurs. This is where I get most of my, my data and new ideas. These people are inventors and they're constantly sending you concepts and, and this is how you start mapping things. So you say there's a lot more value in speaking to the people than reading yeah, TechCrunch, etc. Absolutely, et absolutely. You can you can be reading for years, and it's good to focus. It's good to have an expertise and to know in a specific area. I particularly um, enjoy computer vision as my master thesis, and this is 90% of the investments I've done. So it makes sense to specialize in an area. But at the same time, I could be reading about deep learning and the new computer vision strategies for years. And you know, if I walked around and talked to two or three. Uh, doctors in that particular area, I would get a lot more insights and know where the trends are going. So talking to people moving is uh, key. Cool. Maybe now about um, valuation, very sensitive topic. And I, wouldn't, I couldn't imagine anybody better to ask than uh, Katrin Leonard. Um, are markets overvalued or not? Um, you have a broad portfolio of like basically fund and fund investments. Um, <laughs> there, there are so, like the, the opinions are so broad, what, what would you say? What's your observation? What's your opinion? Yeah, there is a, there is a, there is a well, you can, you can observe um, a higher evaluation than the real evaluation, and, uh, but, but it's still okay, yeah? I mean, you see it at the financing rounds right now, they are, they are bigger, yeah? And, and, the, uh, um, and the prices, you you, are, you you pay for for good for good startups. Uh, they are very quite in, in some sense they are a bit too high, but still com compared also to the U.S., it's in Germany still at a at a level where you have to be care uh, where you have to care and to look very uh, considerably at the market. But uh, we uh, we see it also in the credit structures and the loan structures. Yeah, today the prices are very high and the 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 uh, enterprises can uh, dictate the conditions and the structures of our loan of our loans we, we do. So you have to be careful that it uh, uh, that it has to to 
to get a bit more normalized in, in future and not going up and then there might be a next crisis, but I don't see it right now. Th that's very encouraging to hear. Um, so still tech is not overvalued, um, fantastic. <laughs> I, would, I would like to comment on that. I think in Europe particularly, um, there's a huge amount of overvalued companies. And totally. the math that you need to do is look at money invested uh, and compare it to the disinvestments. And you see that many markets in Europe are not creating value for the VC space. And all you need to do is also do some fund of fund investments to understand that the, the returns, returns on average, on average of, of VC funds are negative. Um, so I think we're seeing many more exits bigger. We see good companies that are not overvalued. So the, the, you know, the right ones are exactly spot on, but a lot of the other ones are piggyback riding on this. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. We need to learn. We need to get more professional services, uh, lawyers, investors. And, and Europe, I think, is going to be in a very good position in the five, six years. Today, I think it's overvalued. I totally agree. I think today uh, the, the valuations are way too high. We have an average A round valuation between 2006 and 2009, or oh no, no, 2014, between two and four million pre money. And that value, and it's 30 uh, data points per year because we do 30 A rounds, so that's the round after our seed round. It was like uh, in that corridor between two and four million. And now the A round has passed, the A round valuation, the average has passed 10 million. So it's more than twice the average of the last 10 years. And we see uh, seed round valuations of like six, seven million uh, pre-money. That's the seed round, double the, the, the average A round in the, in the past 10 years. So I predict that investors who invest today, will, the funds will generate bad returns because we don't see an, a, an, a, an according increase in the valuation on the exit side. Because on the exit side, when you talk to corporates, cons conservative corporates, and you talk about 10 times, 12 times, EBIT multiple, not revenue multiple, and then that doesn't fit because for a 15 million um, valuation on the exit side, you need 1 million EBIT, and that's uh, very rare, uh, it never happen, or very rarely happens. So I think valuations are way too high in the startup uh, segment. It's going to be a hopefully not so big disaster, but it's going to be very painful in the future. But doesn't it uh, depend on the technology? I mean, uh, isn't it, is it over all branches? I, I mean, you see it as a platform, especially, yeah, but in very deep technology branches, is it the same? It's, uh, it's, it, there's differences. I mean, the, the lightweight IT segment is, is much higher valued, but, but it's also in hardware. I mean, we have lost uh, investments that we couldn't close because business angels went in and invested at a six million pre-valuation in the seed round. And we just declined to invest because we know, especially, for example, the hardware segment, you have very conservative buyers. You have many buyers, but very conservative buyers, and they pay EBIT multiples when they acquire a company. So it's going to be very painful in the next five years. And it's going to be uh, going to lead to a shakeout uh, in some investor segments, uh, maybe corporates who uh, have high hopes with their corporate venture funds, and then they they pay too high prices, or maybe business angels who are disillusioned very quickly. Um, I, I, th I mean, I probably it's what, what also people tell me is that it's so difficult because then uh, you only know after five or ten years if something was overvalued or not. And if you have a Facebook, um, I mean, that's one example. In 2008, uh, when uh, people invested at a 12 billion valuation, it was the prime example for the stupidity of VC money. Today, probably nobody would say that it was a stupid idea to invest in Facebook at a 12 billion valuation. Um, so probably both parties are right. We are undervalued and overvalued, or correctly valued, all at the same time. Um, but <coughs> maybe also to that, uh, Matthias, you have, uh, the IBB and also the VC arm, they have been around for really a long time, for over 20 years now. Um, so you have quite a lot of experience, in, and, and maybe not only for Berlin, but in Europe. What do you observe, like, how did the ecosystem change? What changed especially, or can you, can you see a change? Well, the VC market has uh, grown a lot in the last 20 years. And uh, as I mentioned in my intro, we have 350 co-financing partners. So t 20 years ago, there were a handful. Yeah? So, and um, 
especially what is happening in Berlin, that is our turf we, we observe and we, we work on, is a lot of attention worldwide. And I would uh, add, flattering you, flattering you, uh, so the serial investors brought a lot of competence in the market. And that render the startup scene more professional and more reliable. And I mean it. Uh, I don't say it to get only friendly question now in the course, of, but but I really mean it. The serial investors uh, make a big contribution to the market. Yeah, I, I, that's actually also that's true. What well, the competence of the ecosystem is growing a lot, um, especially here. That's true. Maybe before we open up for. Um, uh, for questions, uh, there is one th one question I would also like to ask, and obviously, as corporates and startups, you're always reliant on the overall ecosystem. And if you observe the current political situation, um, then that's, let's say, so in some countries, a little bit difficult. And maybe, Katrin, you, I mean, you grew up in the eastern part of uh, of Germany. Um, you experienced the communist system, then you went to actually to London, into the financing scene. Um, now you're working for one of the largest, you're one of the largest financial institutions in, uh, in Europe. Um, are you sometimes worried um, that, that we would have a shift back to old, old times where you grew up? Or what do you think? Like you have basically seen both systems. <laughs> yeah, I have seen both systems. I'm very happy to be in this system right now. No, I think, I mean, coming back or regarding the startup scene, especially it's here in Germany and in, in, in Europe, to have seen what power they have developed and how independent they are in their sense. Yeah. So I, I'm not scared that uh, uh, even so you see a lot of protectionism yeah, and you, you, you see uh, a lot of uh, dangerous development and in, in some areas of the world. I think the power yeah, and the concentration, what the customers will need, yeah, and the, the, crea the, the creativity to develop solutions, the, the, and also the, the need to, to, to think globally, to, uh, to interact, to, to have networks, and to see all the startups here, the young people who don't care so much about what's going on with Mr. Trump or whatsoever. Yeah? So, so, so that gives me the hope uh, that there is so much energy and, 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 and dynamic in the market that you can't, uh, ha or that you can't damage it by uh, political uh, developments you see right now. Okay, excellent, fantastic. So are there any questions to our panelists? Please. Maybe you can. Oliver Krause, Arthur D. Little, and Matchmaker Ventures. Um, uh, two aspects, probably, concerning the, the funding, the available money. Um, is that also due to regulatory aspects? Because uh, in the US, as I understand, about 90% of the money invested in VC is coming from uh, pension funds and uh, foundations, etc. Um, uh, which is, I think, in Europe or especially in Germany, uh, these institutions are not allowed to invest. Uh, that's number one questions. And a second aspect, uh, probably coming to the um, valuation topic, um, in the B2C space, uh, we have, let's say, a paradigm uh, which says uh, growth is the new profit. Yeah. Um, so, how do you see that in the B2B uh, uh, space? Um, is that a bit more prudent? Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you see that? So great. Maybe first question, who wants to take, you want to take the regulatory? I mean, you have completely right. Yes, yeah, so the VC money in the US comes from pension funds, from institutional investors, also from business angels, of course. And what we have seen, and we are also in, in, in touch with the insurance uh, uh, business and things like that, there are several reasons why they don't invest. First, of course, they, they made bad experience like all of us yeah, during the, uh, the dot-com crisis and they, they went back and they, they, they didn't come 
again, and there are a lot of investment opportunities outside the FSE market, and they, they are going to use. And of course, yes, it is a bit a kind of regulatory. What do you have to put for equity for your investments? But uh, we still have the hope that we can go together and also to, to develop uh, um, ways and solutions to, to try to to mobilize more money also from the institutional in, uh, uh, investors. But it's a long way, and they have to make the experience uh, that VC market, maybe in com combined with other market, equity markets, can be a very good um, some also asset for them. Yeah. Excellent. So maybe very quick answer from one person. Well, if your growth is important, if you're Facebook, you can capture the market. So there is a logic, and I would not neglect it. But growth is not the new profit. Companies will always be valued by cash flow, by profit, in the end. And we see it very nicely at Snapchat. You know, high, high valuation, very bad quarter, big big loss. Valuation goes down. So in the end, cash flow is the decisive valuation factor of a company, and. There might be some time in the middle, in the meantime, where growth might be more dominant because you can achieve a, a significant market position, but it's only valuable if that market position promises more cash flow in the future. Okay, fantastic. So I think we are now at the end of our, uh, our panel. Um, thanks a lot for everybody for being here. Big applause to our panelists. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys, and thank you, Michael, for the Thanks moderation. We Thanks. do appreciate the passion and the excitement. I encourage you to exit stage left and then make yourselves available to our audience. If they have a question they were unable to ask, they can approach you on the sidelines of the Cube Fair and get some advice, get some opinions, or maybe just disagree with you. Not everyone has the same opinion when it comes to investing.